Hi friends, it's Saturday, the 30th of January, and we are um, still working on responding <laughs> in worship and the ways that we respond, affirmations of faith, um, musical offerings, prayers, we'll be talking about that soon. And today is, the title of the chapter is Middle Hymn. So I'm going to read a couple of verses from Psalm 9, the first two verses, and then I'm going to take this opportunity to read from the Book of Order again, and then read about the middle hymn. I'm thanking you, God, from a full heart. I'm writing the book on your wonders. I'm whistling, laughing, and jumping for joy. I'm singing your song. My God. Amen. Love that. Love that. This is from the Directory for Worship, W3.0203, Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs. For millennia, the people of God have sung psalms as praise and prayer to God. Early Christians continued to sing, pray, and study the psalms, interpreting them in the light of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Singing psalms remains an important part of the Reformed heritage. To the psalms, the church has added other hymns, canticles, and spiritual songs. Through the ages and from varied cultures, the church has developed many other forms of congregational song, accompanied by a great array of instruments. We draw from this rich repertoire in the service for the Lord's Day, singing glory to God. And from the poem by Jennifer Roberts, you can sing. You can sing in those low times, in abandoned, love-spent sorrow, or in praise for something so simple and wondrous as the sun rising. But it's just not the same. Not the same as a song sung for you, a soft drift off to sleep melody offered as a gift, an amulet, a blessing floating down. Oh, I love to be carried that way, even off-key, the words misplaced, forgotten, but so perfect in its giving. The songs of comfort in the dark, in fever, or in fear. Songs as offering, as armor, as hands raised, doors flung open, as a place to rest, to triumph, to dream. When I need a song of comfort in the dark, I turn to the Psalms. Turning toward the middle of the Bible, sometimes my finger rests upon a psalm of praise. Other days, it's a psalm of lament. No matter where my spirit rests, either psalm helps me to drift off to sleep. The peace comes from knowing that each is a song sung for me. Each is a gift, an amulet, a blessing. There are days when I need to be carried that way, and many others when I read the psalm as a prayer for someone I know who needs comfort. Just as the psalm sings for me, I sing on for those who can't sing for their, themselves this day. Recently, a family friend died of cancer. She was too young to die. She left two teenage children, a vibrant career, and a strong marriage. She was faithful to her church and dedicated to her community. It was a tremendous loss for everyone. My sister-in-law was enraged at God. Quote, if that were me being taken up prematurely to heaven and made to leave all those who make love real, she ranted, I would have a little talk with God. I'd walk into those pearly gates and tell God, there is no way, Lord, I'm singing in that angel choir. I just don't have any alleluias left in me right now. Her rant rang true for all who knew the tragedy. Sometimes we just don't have any alleluias left in us, whether in heaven or on earth. Our souls just can't muster up that bit of praise and prayer and song. It's not that we don't care for music. It's that we don't care for the circumstances and situations of our lives and world. There are the dark chords of despair and hunger, poverty and loneliness, 
angst and anger that sounds so loud within our souls we can't hear the notes of anything else. You want me to sing? I just don't have it in me, Lord. There is discord in my life and in our world. No alleluias here. Someone else can sing them for now. While life can be discordant, we still are not comfortable with the minor key. We want uh, we want to avoid the dissonance by lingering in the harmony of the major keys. Some churches have passed resolutions not to sing songs in minor key. Too many complaints were heard by the pastors and the music committees about the choice of songs. But for those who want to acknowledge the dissonance, offering only praise-filled songs in a major key doesn't give permission to lament. Where in worship is it acceptable for grief and anguish to be voiced. For those who show up on Sunday morning expecting to open themselves to worship as they sing the opening hymn, there are some days when singing Alleluia can feel jarring. Visiting a rural church while on a mission trip in West Virginia, I praise the beauty of the Alleluia banner sewn by members of the congregation. The letters leapt and curled off the felt conveying a joy and energy only the best artisans could achieve. While finally done, the banner bore the wear and tear of many years. The pastor went on to explain to me a wonderful service centered around the banner. On the last Sunday before Lent, the congregation partip participates in a burial of the Alleluia service. The liturgy shouts, take the Alleluia from us. It continues, Take down the colors of rejoicing and replace them with purple, the color of penitence and preparation. Then the banner is removed from the sanctuary until the trumpet swells of Easter morning beckon the procession, led by the banner back into the sanctuary. Throughout the Lenten season, many churches do not mention the word Alleluia, not in the Gloria, not in the doxology, not in prayer or scripture or hymn. Sarah, a friend and pastor, lost her son 10 days after his birth. She needed permission to bury her Alleluia's. He died suddenly after a routine checkup with the doctor due to, due, a con due to a complication in his heart. All were shocked. She realized how many times as a pastor she had said to someone, you are going to get through this, or your grief will last for a season, and then you will know hope. After facing serious loss for herself for the first time, she wanted to go back and retrieve all those words. She realized she had not been comfortable dwelling with others in their pain and suffering. She uttered words from that place of discomfort. Having gone through the depths herself, she wanted to go back to them and say less and simply, say less and simply be with them more. She realized what she needed wasn't hope. The hope was there, though buried deep. What she needed and what she now would offer in her ministry was permission to be in that dark place. She needed assurance that the despair was an acceptable place to dwell. For the time being. The word Alleluia literally means let us praise Yahweh. It occurs only in Psalms 104 through 150 and briefly in Revelation 19 1 through 8. Though used only in that span of Psalms, it is used often in the beginning and end of a Psalm to lead the reader into tune. Now the word echoes on through the Psalms through the underpeels and many waters of revelation, through the centuries of medieval plain song and Handel's Alleluia Chorus to this day, when its recitation is still an important part of our worship. Even when we can't imagine singing an Alleluia in God's angel chorus, something within us still primitively, primitively utters this language of the soul. No one knew this better than David himself, a composer of psalms and poems, his legacy sings on loudly. His life was discordant, the entanglement with Bathsheba, the abuse of power, 
the disconnect with his sons, and yet he knew the major lifts of the grace of God. It was with acknowledgement of all this that he, though baffled by it all, still sang out Alleluia. His Alleluia wasn't an arrival of pure faith or dismal, a dismissal of all the pain. His Alleluia was a yearning and entreaty in itself. He knew there would be a day for a whole and flawless Alleluia. But for now, there was just his baffled voice. Perhaps David was baffled because he knew that the majors and the minors are reconfigured in God's song. That sometimes in the story of God sung out in the world and its minors that are lifted and the majors that are fallen. Perhaps he was baffled because he knew too that times as we stand before God singing, our priorities are rebalanced. What were major, minor worries and insecurities fall away in view of what is most major and praiseworthy and laudable in the sight of God. Isn't that precisely what singing praise is all about? But the very nature of ascribing praise to some things, we are declaring other things in our lives and in the world as unworthy of praise. By lifting up the praiseworthy, the major and the minor are reconfigured. This is the song that is sung for us. It surely provides comfort for those in the dark. I worked with a youth group who loved to sing. In the church bands, around the table, late at night, early in the morning, in the airport, in the worship, in fellowship, their identity was shaped by song. Pleasing not only to God, but to all who heard their voices, they could sing the sweet, sweetest Alleluia I have ever heard. One of their spine-tingling, poignant, awe-inspiring songs was called Hope for Resolution. It combined the classic of the Father's Love Begotten with a South African freedom song from the days of apartheid. The piece begun hauntingly with the ancient plain song intonations written by Aurelius Clemens Prudentius in the fourth century. Then suddenly, the freedom song broke out. The piece concluded with a weaving together of these two sung prayers. On one youth retreat, we met a man from South Africa named Spiwo. During, during sermons throughout a week-long conference, we heard his tales of struggle in South Africa. In and out of jail for resisting oppression, there were times when his ability to sing the songs of his faith and the songs that prayed for freedom were limited by jailers and prison rulers. Prison rules. At the end of the conference, a member from our group invited him for dinner and discussion. At the end of the evening, the group asked if they could share a song with him. They began, of the Father's love begotten, ere the world began to be. He is Alpha and Omega, he the source, the ending he. When the rhythm changed, and they broke out into Swahili. Singing the freedom song, tears began to stream down his face. You know my song, he cried out. When the piece was over, he expressed his thanks. You don't know what it means to me, explained, to know that people around the world were singing our song of freedom when we didn't always have the freedom or the courage to sing it ourselves. Your singing denounced intolerance and injustice when we were unable to sing it ourselves. Thanks for, this, for keeping the song going on for me. Though the bafflement and imperfection are there now, one day we will stand before God and the perfection and understanding will be complete. Until then, we just have to keep singing the song going for those who can't sing. But even more so, to bring joy to the Lord of song who longs for our praise and singing. Our songs are raised as armor and amulets, blessings and triumphs, doors flung open and comfort in the dark. We sing for all those reasons and in response to God's first loving us in song, in Jesus Christ. So let's respond to that beloved God by saying the prayer taught us.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wow, I should have worn my sweatshirt from yesterday today. These are difficult times. And then the time signatures that are difficult on a staff. So today, even though times are difficult, let us sing. Let us know that even when we can't sing, someone is singing.